everybody, it's Tom, and I'm coming to you this week to talk about FACS, what is the third estate, or quel est le tierete, um, a very significant document, which we're actually picking up in the wake of our discussion last week of Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France and Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, which was a rejoinder to Burke. Burke's criticism, and was really more than a rejoinder, it became an articulation of a certain theory of right that would really sort of cement the fire of revolutionary aspiration in France and elsewhere. Um, but and, and, and became part, as we discussed then, of what would be the tradition of the left. Now, um, what happens in the 19th century is there's a kind of shift in emphasis away from the political forms, which were at the heart of what was happening with the American and the French revolutions, uh, away toward more economic concerns. Because, became, because what became evident was that to merely change the political form was not adequate to address the iniquities, which were the real um, essence of what was amiss with the society's then and the society of today. Uh, the theme, which is at the back of that iniquity, is class. However, I thought before we examine some specific documents from the 19th century, which reflects this sort of shift in emphasis away from a political focus to an economic focus. And by the way, um, one can interrogate the vision there between the political and the economic is actually highly problematic. Uh, you can enfold, for example, or you can invoke, you can invoke something like Marx's concept of the fetish of the commodity to indicate what is problematic about that distinction. In that uh, the economic domain is still ultimately a political domain, but because of the manner in which we have idolized uh, the operations of that sphere as being subordinate to a special set of laws and principles, we have distanced ourselves from an appreciation of the substantive degree to which the operations of the marketplace and how they ramify for social organization, cultural organization more generally, are the outcomes of human will, and as such are malleable. There is no necessitation which can be invoked to justify the iniquities uh, of capitalism or any economic frame that, uh, that, that effectively negates the power of human agency to overcome the structures that human agency itself has wrought. So much by way of tangent, Let's come back to Abbe Sia's document, What is the Third Estate? Um, now, this document arises out of a controversy which is, you know, really a cat catalytic for the French Revolution. And very briefly, what we can say is that the French state was facing a crisis of debt that arose uh, from all sorts of not the least of which would be its own involvement in the American War of Independence. But that was, you know, there were other things, you know, the bloated nature of the state bureaucracy, corruption, all the rest of it, right? In order to offset this deficit, the imperative to levy taxes came to the fore. But in order for those taxes to be levied, they had to proceed through channels uh, that had been established, um, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word, legally, there was still a degree of informality which was going on there, uh, which may be sort of um, lost if we inflect the word legally too strongly. But uh, the gist of the matter, as I understand it, is that after um, the king approved uh, that a certain set of taxes should be levied, then this notion was sent out to the parliaments, which were these bodies that were located 
in uh, municipal vicinities, such as Paris, uh, and then these parliaments, which is, again, it's not like the English word, they would um, register the taxes, and then the taxes would be levied. But there is an ambiguity there as to whether that registration constituted uh, an approval or merely an acknowledgement. And in the light of that ambiguity, significant resistance to the levying of taxes was forwarded. And that resistance was not just about taxation. It was about the orchestration of society and really the orchestration of society along class terms. And the old or medieval uh, framing of the class problem was the dominant one, at least in terms of vocabulary. That is, you have the landed aristocracy, you have the clergy, and then you've got everybody else. Um, or, as the old medieval phrase would put it, uh, there are those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. Um, now, it would be <laughs> uh, extraordinarily generous to say that the aristocracy, aristocracy were those who were fighting, even though that was the sort of nominal origin of their privilege, right? Uh, really, they just had the advantage of conventional ownership and dominance of the land, and on the basis of that dominance, uh, authority, which had uh, problematic consequences. Um, and then, of course, the clergy, the church, sort of providing an ideational complement to the uh, pretensions of the aristocracy. The monarchy exhibits a curious uh, quality in this uh, dynamic because many times the monarchy would actually become a voice uh, to defend the populace, despite the fact that the monarchy ultimately becomes symbolic of the uh, bankrupt conceptions of the feudal order and its own abolition central to the attainment, the positive attainments of the French Revolution, the problematic dimensions of that revolution notwithstanding, i.e. the later events of the terror at all. Um, but the thing about this old class framework, um, it receives a kind of legal recognition in within the French system and, and a very occasionally used uh, you know, in, uh, body known as the States General or Les Etats Generales, uh, if I'm not butchering that too severely. And the last time that it met prior to the occurrences of the uh, late 1780s, early 1790s, was uh, in the early 17th century. Um, the exact year escapes me. That it was like in the 16-teens, so like 1614, 1619, somewhere in there. Um, and here what you would have was an assemblage of the whole French nation to validate some proposition. And the way it worked in the early 17th century is that you had uh, an assembly of people representing the aristocracy, that's the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, and the third estate, everyone else. Um, and each of those estates had one vote. So obviously, the clergy and the aristocracy, one to one, so they, you know, had a controlling block which would negate any expression of truly popular will issuing from the third estate, whose presence was, at least at that time, a nominal one. Shoot forward here to the um, late 18th century, and you have, uh, in order to circumvent the parliament, there had been several parliaments, uh, there have been several efforts to try and find another way to levy the taxes, the countermand, the French debt. And uh, actually, if you go back to the rights of man, Thomas Paine provides a relatively detailed account of those and downs, ins and outs. I'm not going to go into all of them here, except to say that these maneuvers culminated in the calling of the Estates General, 
with the idea being that it was another mechanism whereby to circumvent uh, local resistance. Of course, it utterly backfired, in part because the issue of how the states would respectively be represented in the voting count and their deliberations ultimately led to the, uh, really the, Dissolution of the States General and in its place the National Assembly arose. The National Assembly being responsible for the formal abolition of aristocratic aristocratic privilege, uh, the composition of what would then be the French uh, Constitution, the Declaration of the Universal Rights of Man, and the ball was, was really off and running at that point. Crucial to how the States General broke down was this pamphlet, Abbesias, which took this vocabulary of you know the three estates or the three medieval or feudal classes, and reconfigured it to demonstrate that the clergy and the aristocracy, respectively, were ultimately parasitic, if not hostile, to the idea of the nation. And he oh he offers really on in the course of the pamphlet, which is about ten pages, so it's you know brief. Two um, definitions which play off of each other of the idea of the nation. The first being a functional definition, which actually foreshadows Adam Brates, the economic developments that to which we uh, gave reference at the outset of the video. He says, all right, well, what is entailed in the operation of a nation? And you have sets of activities which can be classed under private public terms. And if you look at who actually operates, who actually undertakes these activities, it is not the aristocracy, it's not really the clergy, it's the general populace that are constituted by the agricultural class, uh, the artisanal class, the merchant class, and then he sort of introduces a miscellaneous category, which can be used to uh, assimilate into the idea of common or third estate participants in artistic or scientific or cultural production. Uh, within that, those are all sort of private activities. The activities which he places under the domain of the public include the military, interestingly certain ecclesiastical functions, which points to a division within the clergy itself that might be in the very um, stimulating exploration there. That there's a tension within the church, between whether it's going to serve the uh, perpetuation of a certain power structure or a sense of social justice to project a, a 20th century term back into occurrences in the 18th century, um, which would in fact invite a rejection of that power structure. Certain administrative functions are also classed under the public uh, sphere, uh, and those have to do with you know infrastructure projects, taxes, etc., etc., etc. So a lot of that stuff is um, apportioned to the state, and it's still only a basic way. What we understand is the state, the modern state, hasn't really come into its own, nor will it come into its own until the nineteenth century. Uh, though the Seeds have been sown and they're beginning to germinate. Um, but what's, what happens is you look again at this assemblage of activities functionally. The aristocracy and the clergy just fall out. And they're like, well, if we are here as representatives of the nation, what are they doing with their assertion of privilege? They're actually acting at odds with the basis of the nation or the nation state. And that's sort of the functional definition, which then leads to the second legal definition, where he says what's really characteristic of a nation is that everyone lives under a common law with common representation. And in the background, he's invoking Rousseau and other thinkers who have advanced that the legitimacy of the polity, its 
sovereignty is to be equated with the people, the nation, and as such, um, with the rejection of aristocratic and ecclesiastical privilege. And it's a persuasive <laughs> account, um, which becomes a rallying cry, and as a result of that rallying cry, ultimately, the Third Estate rejected the notion that it should be uh, represented by just one vote in the Estates General, or even that the classes should vote separately. And obviously, the aristocracy and the clergy pushed back, and even tried to lock them out of the proceedings, which led to the third estate going to uh, what uh, the adjacent tennis courts and taking the famed oath of the tennis court, which was um, a seminal moment in the saga of the French Revolution. Um, yeah, there you have it. So this then is a shift in the notion of class away from its feudal uh, articulation. Under the feudal articulation, obviously, we're also importing a whole theory of divine right. This is secular. And uh, even though there's still oftentimes appeals to divinity in the rhetoric, ultimately the framework eschews that kind of um, metaphysic, if you like. Uh, the other thing that happens is that see that the identity of the society is now being pushed to, again, a kind of economic ground, which is then that, that emphasis is taken up later, especially with Marxism, though not exclusively. Uh, however, it retains the notion of legality as fundamental to the constitution of the nation and as the ground whereupon to legitimate the revolutionary project. And so ultimately, the French uh, get rid of the monarchy and become a democratic republic. And then other things happen after that with Napoleon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it is um, it is a story of complications, uh, uh, really many, many hours at length. Um, but I thought before we jump into the nineteenth century, we should acknowledge this pamphlet and this sort of reconstellation of the notion of class which it represented and which would also you know continue to be significant as left word politics acquire greater identity in the sequel so there you have it this has been tom talking about abbe Sie's fine pamphlet what is the third estate um we're going to come back here in the coming weeks with other stuff Communist Manifesto. Uh, I think I also do a video on a fine essay of Frederick Engels, um, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Uh, but I might interpolate those videos with some different themes. Uh, we might look at some philosophy of mind and some philosophy of science uh, in the meantime. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening, and I will uh, catch you soon.